Hello and welcome to another edition of Ask the Expert. Today we're going to be talking about coexisting with coyotes. And I say coyotes, but the only coyote that I've ever heard of is Wiley Coyote from the Roadrunner cartoons. And um, we'll find out more about today if that's even the correct pronunciation. Today I'm joined by B. Overby, a PhD researcher in the Department of uh, forestry and natural resources at Purdue, and Brian McGowan, one of our Purdue Extension Wildlife Specialists. So B, let's start with you. Am I even saying that right? Is Wiley Coyote correct? Um, is it coyotes, coyote? Help us out and uh, tell us a little bit about this species. Sure, yeah. So that's actually a question I get all the time when I talk about coyotes. I say coyotes. Um, and there's a lot of difference between rural and um, urban pronunciation. So you'll hear that depending on where in the country you are. But actually the term itself is derived long ago from um, indigenous people in central Mexico. And it was spelled in a way that when the Spanish explorers came, they couldn't pronounce it the same way. So it kind of went from there and it broke into two different pronunciations. But Looney Tunes, I think definitely had an impact on how much we hear it as coyote. So my philosophy is if you're talking about coyotes, I don't care how you pronounce it. Um, but I am going to go through a little bit more about the species and, and then we're going to open it up to the Q&A. So I have a very short PowerPoint, just a few slides to talk more about coyotes and then we're going to go through some questions. So bear with me here while I share my screen. All right, so as Wendy said, I'm B, and Brian is in the other screen. And we've both worked quite a bit um, with various species such as the coyote. And this is, I think, a really important one for us to talk about with you guys, because obviously we're seeing them all over the United States, up into Canada and Mexico. It's a native species. And the coyote does actually have a lot of really important roles in the ecosystem, but it can be a little scary if you come across one and you don't know what to do. So um, really kind of working to understand how our behavior impacts the coyote, their behavior and how we can live together peacefully, hopefully is what you'll come out of this with and be a little less apprehensive if you come across one. So getting started, a little bit more about coyotes. So the coyote is the Latin name, the genus species is Canis latrans. So just like our dog and our wolf, they're in the same canis or canid dog-like animal group. And there are 19 subspecies of coyotes in the world. And the way that we come through to a subspecies is broken down by genetic differences, where they live in the world. You'll start to see little physical differences depending on their environment. So there are 19 different groups um, throughout North America. And some of that genetic difference has come from them interbreeding with wolves and domestic dogs. And for an animal to be able to interbreed with another species and produce babies that can then reproduce themselves, that means that those are really closely related species. So yes, wolves, dogs, and coyotes all can have babies together and then those babies, more babies, etc. So you get that kind of genetic mix up between all three species. And for a physical description of the coyotes, they actually come in a wide variety of colors from interbreeding with dogs and wolves. They're medium-sized, kind of small to medium-sized if you think about it compared to an average dog. Um, females and males, we're looking at 15 to 45-ish pounds. They tend to look a lot larger though because of their coat, which gets really thick, especially in the winter. So they can look a little bigger and scarier if you see them around that time of year, but they're actually not too terribly large. And you can see here in the picture, just some of the many varieties that they come in. And we do see in coyotes that they can be albino or uh, melanistic, which is the all black that you might see. Sometimes squirrels around here come in that variety. Those are from genetic mutations. And in coyotes, those genetic mutations tend to come from dog genes, so from interbreeding again. As for activity and behavior, they are normally very shy and elusive. 
So they're afraid of new things, afraid of different things that they don't recognize. They generally tend to stay away. It's when they start to lose that natural fear, which we'll talk about more, that it becomes a problem. But that is their natural way of life is to stay away from things like humans. Um, so they are active both day and night, typically most active at dawn and dusk. They can be very adaptable though. So if it's easier for them to go around and find food sources at night, then they'll start to become um, more active at night. They're most visible and vocal during winter and especially during breeding season, uh, peak breeding season around here, February-ish, and then while raising their young. And these animals are active year round, so they don't hibernate like bears and some other species. You will see them all year round. Some cute little coyote pups. They are generally born in April and May, and there is an average litter size of six. Their gestation, so how long the mother's pregnant, is about 63 days, similar to dogs, and also like dogs, the pups are weaned after 35 days, and that's when they start to explore outside the den on their own a little bit more. And then the pups can leave the family and kind of strike off on their own at six to eight months, but they will occasionally stay with the family. So we will see larger family groups because of that, um, somewhat common in coyotes. And last slide, just talking a little bit more about the family structure here. Um, typically in coyotes, it's not like you think of in wolves where they form these big packs and it may be non-related. Um, it tends to be, if you see a group of coyotes, it's more of a family structure centered around um, alpha pair. There can be some pups from previous litters, new pups. Um, so you're looking at maybe a group of five or six. Um, and they do have a pretty stable home range. They're very territorial. And that home range can depend on things like the abundance of food sources and den sites, competition with other coyotes and animals in the area. So that can range from a square mile all the way up to 24 square miles out maybe where there's more open land. And there are transient, which means um, individual coyotes that will move around and not be part of groups. Although they have seen those, those individuals team up very um, short time just to bring down larger prey, but it's not something where they're going to form a long lasting group um, like you might see in other primates. So that is just a little bit about the species. Um, and I wanted to open it up to Q&A. I think we have a lot of to topics to cover, um, just behavior and how they interact with us. So I'm sure there's a lot of questions there, but please feel free to comment in with more questions and anything that we don't have the answer to, we are going to do a follow-up blog. Um, so try to stump up us, it would be good for us to learn more. So Brian, let me throw this to you. One of the first comments that we have is a concern from one of our viewers about um, people killing these animals for no reason. Um, and you know, people harming wolves and coyotes because of fear. Um, can you speak to that a little bit and, and maybe, um, you know, the need at times for that and also the, the ways that we can, as we titled this, ask the expert, coexist with these creatures? Yeah, sure. So that's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll, uh, you see uh, stories in the media where uh, there's maybe a, a, a coyote in a neighborhood. And so the, the, Folks living there, they get concerned and and kind of create a, create a big big hubbub. But um, you know, just because you see a coyote in your backyard or in a park or whatever, um, probably really isn't cause for concern because they're around us all the time, and most of the time we don't even know it. And so it'd be just like seeing a raccoon, you know, in your in your backyard or something like that. That's really no no cause for concern. And so um, you know, there's been years and years of history of groups and even government. Uh, efforts to get rid of coyotes because um, they can uh, predate on um, livestock. And so that, that is, that is a problem. Uh, but it really has gone to show that just they really, you can't get rid of them because they're so, so adaptable and they can respond to things so, so quickly and that just going out and, and killing coyotes really isn't a good strategy. And so 
if you can target lethal control on an animal that is the one that's the offending animal, uh, that could actually provide some short-term relief in terms of depredation to you know chickens, sheep, those kinds of things. But just going out and just killing coyotes just to kill them um, is really not a strategy that's going to reduce conflicts. And again, most of the time, are you creating a problem when, when none exists? Wendy, you're muted. I can't hear you. I guess that brings us to another thing for you, B. Um, what do they actually eat? Are they coming after my dogs or my chickens or my cows or, or are they, you know, herbivores for whatever meat? I mean, what, what are they after when, or do I hear, am I seeing them hunt? Like what, what are they doing? So they are considered um, omnivores, although largely they do eat more than plant material, but they're very opportunistic. So they're going to eat whatever is the most readily available at the time. They tend to eat mostly rodents. So you're looking at things like rabbits, voles, but they will eat human garbage. They will eat outdoor pets if you're not keeping a close eye or you have outside cats. Um, they'll take advantage of things like that. So, you know, just, just be aware of them. Um, and we can talk more about how to protect your pets in that case, but they adapt. That is, I think, the number one thing to remember about coyotes. And like Brian said, trying to control um, or just take out individuals or even to relocate, um, research has shown that that's not effective. So it's more about us and our behavior and learning to adapt with them because they're not going to go away. But there are plenty of ways to keep, keep safe, even though they um, can go after various things like so it sounds like what you're saying is they are quite beneficial. They do um, help rid us of some of the creatures that we don't want around us. So um, I guess what benefits um, do they bring to our environments and, and the nature around us? Yeah, so coyotes are considered, especially around here, uh, one of the predators, so a keystone species. So if you're familiar with the kind of the concept of ecosystem, so everything that's living in this environment, if you take out one of those top predators, um, their fulfilling role in that ecosystem, that's very important. So um, they feed on and keep control over other things like um, we would call them kind of like middle predators, meso predators, that means middle, things like rabbits, skunks, raccoons, foxes, and also help to control deer populations. And then that has a trickle down effect. So um, those meso predators might feed on eggs, for example, in nests. So that would impact negatively impact birds if the, the meso predators got out of control. And um, the deer may, might impact the saplings that are trying to grow in the forest floor. And so that might impact the tree growth. And if it's nearby a stream, there might be stream bed erosion, water comes out. So it, it just, it can literally impact everything in the ecosystem when it gets out of balance. So them being at the top really keeps everything in a natural healthy state. Um, and we've seen in research, for example, when they reintroduced wolves into Yellowstone, how that rebalanced that ecosystem even after 70 years of wolves not being there. So it had an impact, on, a positive impact on so many different things. So. Just like that, coyotes, um, if they went away completely, we would um, potentially be in trouble with our other species. Yeah, actually one more, one more benefit is they also eat the eggs of uh, candid geese. And so in urban areas where giant candid geese are actually a problem, uh, they can actually take out up to almost 50% of the candid goose eggs in the area. Just a reminder for those watching at home, if you have any questions, put those in the comment section on our Facebook page and um, B and Brian will answer those. Um, Brian, talk to us a little bit about um, some of the research that has been done. Um, I know that the DNR has some resources and other resources um, that folks can learn a little bit more about coyotes and, and control and their relationship to them. Yeah, so like, uh, you know, especially for, you know, there's really kind of two, two things to consider, you know, coyotes in urban areas and coyotes in rural areas are really behaviorally a little bit different. And so there's actually some good resources out there. Uh, there's the urban uh, coyote research project in the greater Chicagoland area. 
It's a project that's been going on for, I think, over 20 years or right around there. Uh, Stan Garrett, he's a professor at Ohio State, and he's been leading that uh, effort with, uh, with other researchers. But they've got a lot of website uh, information on their website. I think you're going to post it there. Uh, not only information about the project, but also with coyotes and how to live with them and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but in, cer- in terms of, you know, dealing with um, issues, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. You know, a lot of times now people have uh, chickens or other animals, you know, that's kind of a growing thing now, even in urban areas. And so there's a couple things you can do to protect those animals from, from coyotes and really other predators. Uh, one would be to kind of make sure that they have some type of a structure that they can be housed in at night. And so with chickens having a chicken coop that coyotes can't enter, even having fencing that goes down a foot below the soil because some predators can dig under fencing, uh, those are things that work really well. Um, With coyotes, the the best kind of fencing they've found with livestock in in larger areas is actually electrified fencing. So that would either be single wire fencing or uh, uh, the the netting, the electrified netting that that acts as a fence. That's actually pretty good. Uh, But there's also other things that they've worked that have shown to work. uh, Things like guard dogs, llamas, donkeys, uh, those living with uh, uh, free ranging poultry and sheep and, and cattle. Those can actually prevent uh, predation from from coyotes uh, and also a thing called flandry so flandry is uh, sometimes uh, basically red nylon strips about a foot long that that's very um, uh, covers like a, a on along a, a rope or sometimes it's on electrified wire uh, they've used that historically with wolves to keep wolves out of areas and it works pretty good for those it does work for coyotes but not quite as long as it does for wolves uh, with any kind of a scare kind of a thing like that, eventually the newness of it wears off. And uh, if they're desperate enough or if they feel secure enough, they'll cross that that border. Uh, and sometimes people will combine flandry with fencing and some of these other things. And so there's a lot of things folks can do. Uh, it really depends on kind of what your issue is with coyote depredation um, and then also time and resources and things that you have to, to invest in those kinds of things, which, you know, a lot of things come down to that. let's get back to you a little bit um question how do i know if it's a wolf a coyote a koi wolf a dog like how do i know what i'm hearing all i hear is howling at night yeah typically well it can depend on the region you're living in as well but um if you're hearing a lot of howling around here it is most likely coyotes it's very high pitched and i'm going to um well wendy's going to post a video um, that also includes tips on hazing, which we'll talk about later, but it has the example of the coyote howl. So um, that's probably the best way if you're just hearing something around here. Um, it wouldn't be a wolf, but talking about I think she she froze there. Uh, I can kind Maybe of jump in there. Another- Oops. Oh, go um, ahead. You were freezing up on us, B. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much of that you heard. I apologize for that. But um, Wendy is going to post a video with tips about hazing, which is something we're going to talk about later. And there are coyote calls in that video. So you can kind of hear what they sound like. But if you're hearing that at night around here, um, especially if you're kind of out on the outskirts of town, it's probably a coyote. It's, if it's very high pitched. Um, you're not going to be hearing wolves around here. Dogs tend to do more barking. um, So you should be able to kind of distinctly hear the difference on that. And uh, the question about koi wolves, the hybridization between um, wolves and dogs and coyotes, that's another whole topic that's kind of a, a bigger one to cover. But Essentially, the coyotes we have here are mostly coyote. They're kind of considered the Western type of coyote, which is smaller. And then you go up north and east, there's a little bit more of a mix of wolf in there. So they tend to be a little bit larger. Um, And there's a lot of research that's being done on them and talking about it's kind of a contentious topic of is this starting to become a different species or subspecies or things like that. But um, yeah, that's, that's kind of an interesting topic to cover as well. Yeah, with the, the, the wolf hybridization, um, you know, re- 
new research tools are, are really valuable because you can answer questions that you couldn't before. Uh, but some of the problems with that, particularly with some of these genetic tools they have, they can really delve deeply into the genome. And so what they found is basically that you've got wolf genes and basically all coyotes east of the Mississippi. And so, and that's nothing new. That's been the case for the last 50 years or more. And so, you know, sometimes people like, in, and as B mentioned, it's kind of contentious. Uh, so you, you know, you hear stories about coy wolves and things like that. Well, technically that's really not a good term because all coyotes have basically some level of wolf genes in them. And so that's really a term that, that researchers and, and biologists don't use. Um, the other thing with like uh, dogs and coyotes breeding is while they're capable of that, it's a, it's a very rare event because uh, canines are competitors with each other. And so wolves just tend to displace coyotes coyotes will displace fox and other domestic dogs. And so they're really much more likely to kill a dog than they would be to try to mate with it. And so uh, even though, you know, those things certainly are, are, are possible, I just want to kind of make that clear that that's, that's a pretty rare event. Yeah, same goes for wolves. I mean, really the, the way that wolves population numbers went down, it kind of left them in some cases with no choice but to mate with the coyotes. So, you know, that's where we get that from, but it's definitely not their preferred um, partnership. So I guess next, let's talk about where and when might I run into coyotes? So specifically in the Indiana area, I don't know, Brian, if you want to talk about that as I'm kind of new to this region, but. Uh, yeah, you know, um, uh, you can really almost see them anywhere. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I've, a lot of times when people see them, they're actually roadkill on the side of the road. Uh, and usually really you, you see signs or, or notice signs of coyotes rather than seeing them. And so you might see tracks, uh, you can see piles of scat that they use to mark territorial boundaries. And so a lot of times uh, paths and roads and things like that uh, make good boundaries for them. And so though we, we encounter their, their droppings on, on, on those places. Um, obviously the, the calling is something, the howling uh, is something you do, but uh, sometimes they don't do that, uh, particularly in urban areas. And so just because you don't hear coyotes howling doesn't necessarily mean they're not around. Uh, but you can really find them. You know, I've seen them crossing roads. I do a lot of driving in my, my job before, you know, COVID-19. And uh, I would occasionally see them crossing roads and crossing a field in the distance and that kind of a thing. And they're really pretty easy to tell from that standpoint because their tails are really thick and they tend to hold them down. And so they've got large ears and that tail down. And when they're moving, they tend to really kind of go in a straight line where if you ever walked a dog or walked with a dog, you can see them kind of going all over the place, um, at least mine because they're not <laughs> trained very well, uh, where coyotes tend to be more purposeful in their movements and things. And so that's another helpful tool, especially when you come to see the tracks. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add to with the vocalizations that you might hear, and I always tended to hear them largely at dusk um, as the sun was setting, but I have gotten a lot of questions about, does that mean that they're taking down prey or they're out hunting? And those calls are not malicious. I mean, if you think about it, if they were chasing something down, it wouldn't necessarily make sense to be advertising that to every other predator that might be around or other coyotes that might compete with them. So. Um, those vocalizations can be just family communications. It could be a coyote looking for a mate, depending on what time of year it is. They could just be teaching the pups the different communication um, or just letting other coyotes in the area know about their ranges of their territory. So it's not something meaning that you should be afraid um, because they're looking for you or anything like that. So the next thing I wanna talk about is safety. Um, we talked about coexisting with coyotes and um, how do we, what do I do if I see one, if I'm out with my dog, I'm out with my child, there is one in my yard, yeah. what sure. should I do? So first of all, just to kind of throw it out there, um, even though there is a big fear of coyotes, um, it is really the, them attacking or even killing a human is very rare. I mean, there's been two fatalities in all the time that it's ever been recorded in history in the United States and Canada. So 
Um, and I read a statistic that I really liked, which was that you're more likely to die from a flying golf ball or champagne cork than you are to be attacked by a coyote. So if you think about that, um, you know, you're much more likely to get bit by a dog than a coyote. So, you know, and we're not, we're not as terrified of seeing strange dogs. So just keep that in mind. Um, Pe people who have golfed with me might argue that that's not true. So just want to throw that in there. Hopefully not. So when you're, um, so if you're out walking um, by yourself, or if you're out walking with a dog or a child, it's a little bit different, but um, first and foremost, uh, keep in mind, a lot of people like the thought of making friendly coyotes or feeding them, not a good thing, not a good thing for you, not a good thing for the coyote. Once they start to lose that natural fear of people, it's really dangerous for the coyote because it might start to see you as a source of food, but it might also see the neighbor kid next door as a source of food and approach a child, and then that coyote is, is going to be in trouble. So it's just not a good thing. Don't do that. Um, if you come across them when you're by yourself, a big human, they're, they, they're smart. They're not going to try to go after, in, in almost all situations, they're not going to go after a big human. But what we recommend if it's a situation where the coyote is not doing just normal coyote behavior, for example, um, if you see it during the day, it's really close by you, it's in a place that shouldn't be even approaching you or doing something along those lines, we recommend something called hazing, which is just making ourselves seem scary so that they can become scared of humans again. So thinking about the things you do, um, to scare off a dog, just looking bigger, waving your arms, jumping up and down, shouting. Um, if you have like a soft like tennis ball or something you can throw their way, um, definitely look at them. They, you want them to know that you see them. So um, they're not feeling like they could sneak up or anything like that. Um, and if you are out with a dog, first things first, if it's not leash, put on a leash immediately. If it's a small dog and you can pick it up, pick it up. Now they're, if they saw a Yorkie and they were going to go for that Yorkie, they're probably not going to go for the Yorkie that a big human is holding. It's a, a much different scenario. So pick it up if you can. And if you have a big dog, don't let it interact with the coyote. Don't let them sniff noses or anything. That's not going to go well. Um, and also coyotes are very similar to dogs. They can carry a lot of the same diseases dogs can, like rabies, distemper, canine distemper, parasites. So you don't want that interaction anyway. Um, Definitely just be assertive, not necessarily aggressive, assertive, uh, just confident and assertive and, um, you know, back slowly away, never run. Teach your kids, never run. These animals have a prey drive. They're going to chase things that run. So slowly back away. If you're out with a child or if you're looking to teach a child what to do if they come across one when they're alone, um, First and foremost, and this goes for dogs as well, teach children not to go up and try to interact with an animal they don't know or that they haven't gotten permission from an adult to interact with. Um, same with dogs. You don't, they don't necessarily know the difference between a coyote and a dog. They might look very similar to them. So um, just a good rule of thumb. If the child can make themselves look bigger, if they're wearing a coat, they can open their coat. Um, extend their arms, and then just slowly back away and look for an adult if there's one nearby. And last thing I wanted to cover when it comes to pets is um, if you have a fenced-in yard or just a yard in general that you let your pets out, that you let your pets out in. Um, outdoor cats. I know that's another contentious topic, but there's not a whole lot you can do to protect your cat when it's on. It's, it's a good size snack for a coyote. So it's just for cats and cats. And we won't even get into the cats and birds thing, but it's just not a good idea. Um, if you have a dog that goes outside, keep an eye on it, especially if you know there are coyotes in the area. It's a small dog. Coyotes can climb fences, um, especially the chain link. It's a nice little way that it can climb up. There are roll bars you can apply on top of your chain link. So once it gets to the top, it keeps there's a bar that keeps rolling, so it makes it harder for them to get over. Um, so, you know, keep an eye out for that. And um, yeah, just just take care of your pets. They, they are um, going to attract coyotes and we don't want coyotes in the neighborhood to learn that pets are a food source because they're gonna keep coming back. 
So let's talk about and why. Can I add something there, Wendy, real sure, quick? Go ahead, Brian. So, so B made a really good point about, about the hazing, but I, the thing I really want to emphasize with that is is people shouldn't create a problem that's not there. So if a coyote is just out and about, not causing any issues, not behaving abnormally, you shouldn't do the hazing. Okay, so just because you see one doesn't mean you should do that necessarily. Uh, the mm -hmm. other thing is you really got to be careful not to uh, approach a coyote while doing that or you know you, you always got to leave them an escape path and things and so you never want to corner you know a coyote or, or any wild animal so just a couple things about that for sure um like at dusk when you're hiking and it turns and runs the other way go a different way so just be smart um if you don't know the animal if you don't just like you if you don't know the dog or you don't know the person don't mm -hmm. talk to strangers so mm -hmm. Um, same thing goes with coyotes. Uh, but I guess my question is, why are they there? Like, why are they coming in my yard? Why are they coming on my property? And what can I do to stop them? Um, are they, Brian, let's start with you. I know there's a, a concern for damage that they might cause. Um, what can I do about that? And what damage might they be causing on my property? Well, you know, I mean, outside of maybe killing animals that you don't want killed, um, I'm not really sure they're going to be causing any damage. And so, as B mentioned, like one of their, their primary food items are rodents. And so in a backyard, you can have voles, uh, you can have moles, which aren't technically a rodent. Uh, many of these things that our yards provide that are actually good food for, for coyotes. And so um, that would be one thing. Another thing is it could just be passing through. Uh, it can go be going from point A to point B, and most animals are just like us, where we are going to take the path of least resistance. And so if there's trails or things like that or openings, or sometimes if you have a fence and that's a barrier and it could funnel animals along that fence line, um, you know, those are kind of things sometimes what happens out there. So, so again, most of the time when you, when you see one, uh, it's really not a cause for concern because quite honestly, it could, that same animal or other animals could have been around for quite some time and you just haven't had an opportunity to, to see them. Um, I, I'll contribute a little bit there too with, um, with backyards and why it might be there, why it might want to go on your property. Um, typical things that it might start to associate human habitations and humans themselves with food rewards. So it might go after your trash if it's unsecure and get in there to eat it. Um, bird feeders, if you're feeding outdoor animals and leaving that food down overnight, you want to secure that. Um, it, if you have outdoor, indoor outdoor pets or feral cats, they start to see those as potential food sources. So all of that can contribute. If you have a lot of property and you have brush or rock piles or brushy areas, you can cut those back or take those down because those can be potential gun sites. So that might be, might be scouting that out as well. So just a few reasons why they might be going into your neighborhood. Okay. Um, so I've heard potentially that the Department of Natural Resources at times might release coyotes. Is that true? And um, why? <laughs> well, the, the why it makes uh, a lot of sense because there really is no logical reason for that because it's not true. They don't they don't do that. And so for whatever reason, rumors get started where uh, and not just in Indiana, I hear this a lot from colleagues around the country where, uh, you know, the DNR is releasing, you know, snakes to control turkeys or this or that. And and none of that's true when they they, they have done some. Uh, the releasing of animals that the DNR has done has been to supplement uh, populations where at once maybe they weren't very common or have been removed from Indiana and they're bringing them back. So like the river otter is a good example of that. Uh, they were native to Indiana and they disappeared from Indiana and many other Midwestern states. And so uh, they trapped some and released them in Indiana to, to reestablish that population. Wild turkey would be another example of that. Um, but uh, they, that for whatever reason, people got that idea that they were doing that. Uh, coyotes, as you've heard, are very adaptable creatures. They, they, you can even find them in downtown Chicago. And so they've just kind of expanded their range naturally over the last hundred years, not only in the Midwest, but also the Southeastern United States, where historically that's not where their distribution has been. Mm -hmm. I'll just throw in a little bit more there too. Um, 
the difference between the idea of releasing an animal and relocating, sometimes that could start rumors, but um, there have been relocations of coyotes that they've attempted, and this kind of goes into why we should coexist with them, because those were also unsuccessful. So they might take coyotes out of an area where it's really not safe for them to be, like, for example, near the airports, and bring them far away to a place that has wonderful habitat for coyotes. And um, in Chicago, for example, they tracked those, they did it with 12 coyotes to see what happened, and all 12 of them pretty much immediately headed back towards, they didn't make it back to their, to where they were found, but they didn't stay in the place that they were put. And all 12 of them eventually were killed, either being hit by car or by hunters. So it's just, it's another thing, just like control that ultimately is not a successful um, way to, to move coyotes out of areas, unfortunately. And other coyotes will move back in, so. So to kind of wrap up, um, what do I do if I do have a problem? Are there hunting and trapping regulations? Um, mm -hmm. if, if I'm on my property and it is going after my chickens, Brian, you mentioned this earlier about um, maybe targeting specific animals. Um, just what are my options um, if, if I can't successfully coexist? Well, the, the law in Indiana is uh, as a landowner, you can trap or shoot coyotes on your property throughout the year. You don't need, there's no permit required, that kind of a thing. Um, obviously those are animals that are trapped during the, the fur trapping season. So people that trap coyotes during that time, um, you need a trapping uh, a license to do, to do that on different properties, that kind of a thing. But if you're a landowner, you've got conflicts and, and with coyotes. And so you're trying to remove those a particular animal that's maybe killing your chickens or something like that. Uh, you are within your rights as long as you're not breaking any other laws to do that. So for an example though, if you're in town and you've got backyard chickens, uh, then shooting a firearm in your backyard is not lawful. So you obviously that wouldn't be an option. So you gotta use some common sense regarding that. Mm -hmm. And the hunting season here in Indiana uh, for coyotes is middle of October to middle of March. But um, yeah, you can, um, if, you can shoot them on your property, but if that's not something you're comfortable with, you can also contact, depending on what town you're in, animal control, local animal control, or the DNR as well for more guidance. There's also a professional nuisance wildlife control operators. Uh, many of them do uh, coyote uh, conflict management as well. And so typically we think of those people that, that trap uh, raccoons out of attics and those kinds of things. Uh, but uh, they, a lot of them do a lot of different kinds of animals. So you can go on the DNR website and they've got a list of licensed nuisance wildlife control operators by county. So whatever county you're in, you can look it up there and maybe get a couple and they list what animals that they work with. And keeping in mind too, if you have a coyote that is, if you think of a very aggressive dog, you know, coming at people with growling hackles up, that's something that needs immediate attention. So that's something you'd immediately reach out to someone to help you with. That's not something that you'd want to wait or let it continue to be in the neighborhood. That's a whole different story. So I guess final thoughts as we wrap up, um, be if you want to start, but coyotes overall good, do a lot of good things for our environment, typically mm -hmm. don't bother us or our pets um, on our properties. Um, anything else that you want to add um, to let us know how we can coexist? Yeah, I mean, really just keeping in mind they're here to stay. So um, it's it's really on us to, to change our own behavior to make it safer for us and for them. And to keep in mind that they do have that important role in our ecosystem. So, you know, if, if they were gone, um, we would have a lot of other problems. So they filled in a, a niche, a role from some of the areas where wolves used to be, and uh, they may not fill it completely, but um, they do help to control other, other species. So they, they boost biodiversity in general. We see just more healthy, abundant, different types of life because of coyotes. So just remember that when you see and hear them, if they have their normal behavior, we're really moving in to their territory in some ways too, when we have new subdivisions and things like that. So we have to kind of learn to live together in that regard. 
Yeah, I don't have anything else to add. That was <laughs> that was well said. Um, uh, <laughs> they are here forever and they do a lot of things. To, uh, you know, a lot of times people think of animals that eat other animals is, is a bad thing. Predation is a bad thing, but it's a natural process and one that's quite frankly required to keep our other animals in check and keeping the populations healthy. Yeah. And they're a resilient, intelligent species. So, you know, they get a, a bad rap, I think, because of that. A lot of the species that are like you think about crows and things that are nuisance animals, but they adapt and their numbers are not going down, even with all of the different human disturbances and changes that we're making in the planet. So, you know, that kind of resilience and ability to bounce back and work with um, the changes makes them a really interesting species and a really kind of like a success story in some ways. So a little, little respect for that too. So bottom line, they're not all like Wile E. Coyote and they're not all out to get us and do horrible yeah. things. No, they're not quite as good as Wile E. Coyote. <laughs> I don't know what they would think about Roadrunners. They, they probably might be in a little trouble there. Well, thank you, B. Thank you, Brian. Um, this was really interesting uh, and really insightful and hopefully gives us all a new respect and appreciation um, and less fear of coyotes. Um, we invite you all to come back next week. We're changing the time a little bit. We'll meet at 1.30 next Thursday. Um, we'll be talking about invasive insects with Liz Jackson and Elizabeth Barnes. So 1.30 next Thursday, invasive insects and how you can uh, keep them off your property and, and protect your wildlife and other plants. So thank you again for joining us today. If you have any further questions, put those on the Facebook comments and B and Brian will answer those after the fact. And as B mentioned, we'll have a blog coming out on our Got Nature site in the next couple of weeks about coyotes as well. So thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks.